Thanks for coming on. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, uh, both uh, Scala and uh, Lyft. Uh, the focus will be mostly on the Lyft web framework, and along the way we'll see some uh, Scala constructs as well, and I'll try to explain uh, what's happening. Um, I don't know, are there any people already familiar with Scala in the, in the room here? Okay, quite a few. It's nice. Um, I really believe that the Scala offers developers a lot of power uh, that's not currently available in Java. Um, and with this power, uh, some people came up with a, a really nice uh, web framework called it. And uh, it really uses these uh, new constructs uh, that are available in the Scala language. And I hope uh, you'll like it. Uh, it's a framework that does things quite different from other web frameworks. So if you're familiar with uh, WebMVC or Struts or JSF, or, you will see some similarities, but still uh, it's, it's quite different. Um, and whether you like it or not, uh, you'll have to decide for yourself. So, a small bit about me. Um, I work at Influence Support in the Netherlands, which is a medium-sized software consultancy firm. I work as a lead developer mainly in the Java department, uh, designing, architecting, uh, implementing uh, systems for uh, customers, uh, large customers in the Netherlands, like uh, banks, uh, government institutions, etc. Um, and um, I do this mostly using Java, but in my spare time, I really, really like to work with, uh, with Scala. I'm trying to push it uh, to some customers as well, but uh, they won't buy it yet. But that will come, that time will come. Uh, as I see that uh, Scala is really uh, maturing uh, uh, currently and uh, getting commercial support by uh, TypeSafe, the company started by Martin Odeski, the guy who founded Scala. So I see a bright future uh, ahead. So I like writing and speaking, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, and um, yeah, it's just in general a very good uh, thing that we as developers share our knowledge uh, with, with each other and uh, I hope uh, we can do that uh, in this session as well. So the first question that uh, I want to ask ourselves is what should a web framework actually do? And I really don't hate Rails but uh, in some aspects it's not really uh, an ideal web framework so I really like this uh, batch. Anyway, so I tried to boil it down to some of, uh, basic constructs, right? So a web framework should help us constructing, obviously, web applications and, and views for users uh, and browsers. And, and, and to do this, you need some kind of view language and some kind of templating, right? So you need to mix and match various pieces of your view together and be uh, reusable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those views need not, uh, don't only need to show static content, we also want to show uh, dynamic content from the database, from other external systems, uh, well, uh, whatever you can think about. Um, and they should all be able to uh, react uh, to input from the user. This is all very basic, but, but try to uh, keep in mind as we go through the presentation uh, how other frameworks handle this kind of stuff and how it compares to, uh, to Scala and this. Uh, the last two bullets have a uh, sort of a question mark because uh, whether really abstracting away from the HTTP response and request uh, cycle is really something that a web framework should do. I mean, you can you can debate about that. Um, some frameworks really pride themselves on the fact that they're really close to the metal, and other ones really pride themselves on the fact that you don't have to think about HTTP requests at all. Um, I find that the lift is somewhere in the middle between those two extremes. Um, and, and you can choose yourself in which direction you want to move on uh, this uh, scheme. Uh, the other one, uh, the interactivity. I mean, uh, more and more sites uh, uh, are using uh, very interactive constructs, so not just uh, a form post and a result, but also a AJAX calls and uh, server push from the server uh, directly to users. Um, so I really think that a, a, a modern web framework should have an answer to that. And, Fortunately, uh, this does have an answer to this uh, as well. And all this should be done in, uh, in a way that is easy to work with for developers. It gives us the power that we need, and also the power uh, to do it productively, so it should be concise, not too verbose. Um, it should perform really well because we like to scale. Eh? We have customers with, uh, which large, with uh, large websites and uh, uh, really anything uh, that doesn't scale uh, falls off the list uh, really quickly. And security is of course uh, also a primary concern when building uh, web applications. And thinking about things like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, etc. 
Um, more and more web frameworks have uh, default uh, protection against uh, these types of attacks. Um, and uh, Lyft has them uh, as well, fortunately. So starting with this, uh, this is step um, This is already a point where, where Lyft uh, kind of diverges from, uh, from other web frameworks in the sense that it's really a view-first uh, kind of frame framework. So a more traditional framework would be model view controller, uh, where the controller kind of acts like the hub between uh, everything in your application. Um, and that's, that's where the main uh, uh, gist uh, is, uh, is in your application. Um, and this, uh, you really start uh, at the view, and the view consists of pure XHTML or HTML5. I don't know if you've been at the uh, uh, talk by Arun Gupta on uh, Java EU7 and, and JSF, and he also says, well, it's pure XHTML. But then again, if you look at JSF, Facebook, there are all those um, custom prefixes, all those custom components, and if you give this to a, developer, uh, to a designer, uh, he can't do anything with it, right? So there's always this gap between uh, how a designer, uh, just someone uh, who does uh, graphics work, how a designer uh, creates uh, web pages, and how we as developers uh, want to take these pages and add functionality to it. So this tries to take a very designer-friendly uh, approach to that, and I'll, uh, I'll show you uh, in a little demo uh, what that looks like. Um, but of course, uh, the, these views have to be uh, uh, templated as well. So um, in this case, uh, Lyft uh, uh, offers several constructs uh, to do that. Uh, and, and for the templating, there's a special uh, namespace introduced into these views. Um, one in which have an outer template like, uh, like this. So it's just uh, uh, some HTML that you uh, get from the designer or that you download from the design site. Actually, this is one that I got from a free uh, free website uh, template uh, uh, website. Um, and then you just add an anchor point, a lift byte point, and you give it a name. In this case, I gave it the name content. And this tag will be picked up uh, uh, at a later stage by the library. So you have this, this master template uh, with this byte uh, point in it, and then you can have a specific page, for example, a sign-up page, uh, which contains only this form. And what you have here is just uh, plain HTML, which, uh, which encodes uh, this form. And around this form, you put this div uh, called surround tag, and you say surround it with the default template. And, uh, and uh, insert whatever is inside uh, this tag at, uh, at the bind content. Um, you can also uh, embed different templates uh, in each other, so it's, that's more like a, like include mechanism. Um, so you can mix and match those approaches. And in this case, I'll quickly show what it looks like in actual application. I'm switching to uh, IntelliJ which I uh, use a lot for Scala development. Uh, actually, there's also a, a Eclipse plugin for uh, Scala, which is getting better and better uh, at the moment. Uh, but so far, I've found that uh, IntelliJ support is uh, yeah, somewhat better. Um, so let me give you a quick rundown of the uh, actual structure of the application. In this case, I've uh, created it using a, a Maven-based POM file. You can also use any other build systems that are popular in Scala world, like uh, SBT, Simple Build Tool, but in this case I've stuck to what I know and what I knew, and uh, that is Maven. So you can see here this, uh, this problem. Uh, and of course, it just uh, follows the familiar structure, right? It's the source, main uh, resources, and in this case, instead of Java, we have Scala subdirectory. And a Lyft application always has a, a boot class. And in this case, the boot class uh, is the uh, hook which is started by the Lyft framework, which is executed. And you can do any configuration inside this, uh, this boot class. Um, all that you have to do is to define a boot method, and the framework will call this. And in this, uh, I, uh, I, I tell the Lyft framework that uh, all my custom code is in the Compact Info Support uh, uh, sub package. And I build a uh, sitemap. I'll show you later what, uh, what it exactly is. Anyway, there's lots of configuration that you can, uh, can do in this uh, boot class. Um, moving on, we have 
this common info support package that I registered here in the boot class. And there's my actual uh, Scala uh, code uh, written to the diff framework. Um, we'll go through those as we uh, see the features uh, one by one. So I'm going to direct them now. Uh, and of course, the web app directory itself. So as you can see, um, it has a web page with a web.xml. So it's a diff framework is completely uh, uh, Java E uh, uh, server based. So you can use it in any container uh, that uh, supports the server spec. Uh, in this case, I've, uh, I'm running it uh, use, using uh, the Maven uh, jetty column uh, run uh, uh, goal. So just uh, the jetty uh, server container. But you can do it in Tomcat or JBoss or whatever uh, you like. Um, so in this uh, web app folder, of course, uh, that's where our views are. That's uh, what we were talking about. So here is this uh, default uh, HTML. Uh, which contains this, this template that I downloaded from the internet, and it looks like uh, looks like this in action. So let me send to that in the home page. Um, by the way, here you see a rendering of this uh, uh, menu that I defined in the boot class. So we'll see how that is done uh, a bit later. Uh, and in this case, I just had this, uh, this template, which uh, looks kind of nice, and then in the, in the content section, I uh, splice in my uh, special uh, parts of the application that, I, uh, that I'm defining. Uh, and just to show you that it's just all HTML, I'll scroll through it a little bit. Nothing special here, no special gift components or whatever. The only thing that we will encounter later is this uh, lift column bind uh, element uh, with uh, a name that's used later by the surround package to, uh, to insert content here. Um, and in this case, the home page is uh, recites in uh, index.html. And now you might be thinking, hey, I see another HTML tag, another body tag, it's kind of duplicate. And then there's a reason for this. You don't, you don't have to do this. I could could have left this out and just uh, had this uh, div uh, uh, with uh, the specific form and the specific uh, code. But what we can do now is let uh, a designer just open this uh, uh, this subview, so to say, as a standalone view, and it will just render, right? So, and in this case, what div does is it looks at the uh, body tag of this uh, subview, and there we indicate within the class uh, attribute that we insert lift. Oh, the actual content is at the following content ID, uh, index content. And that just happens to be the uh, div that's below, that has the ID the index content. So what actually happens at runtime is that lift will ignore this when uh, uh, the templating kicks in and this is a version to the master uh, default. But this helps when, uh, when you're working with designers and they just want to open a single page and uh, they want to edit it, uh, etc. Um, so what more is there to say about uh, uh, the templating? Uh, not very much, I guess. Yes, I want to show you that uh, in the slide I uh, showed this uh, lift column surround uh, tag, which was in line with our view, uh, like this. Surround, uh, blah, blah, blah. The content was inside there. But of course, your browser doesn't really like that when it, uh, it opens uh, such a tag. So there's an alternative scheme to uh, to invoke this uh, surround mechanism. And again, it's encoded inside uh, the class attribute. You do uh, lift uh, column surround. And then like a query parameter, you can then say, OK, surround it with the default template uh, and add the content point tag that we provide in this master template. So in this case, uh, as long as your uh, HTML designer doesn't remove this uh, class, everything will be fine. And, uh, at runtime, time, your uh, views will be uh, uh, spliced together by this. Okay, let's get back to this presentation. We also uh, decided that we wanted to show uh, dynamic content. And you were probably wondering, uh, right, so all these views are only uh, HTML with some uh, magic uh, classes in there that references some uh, lift functionality, but 
there's no actual code in the templates, right? You, some some temp templates in languages like JSP allow you to encode real code, loops, if analysis, etc., etc. So, what are we going to do uh, in Lyft to uh, to enable uh, this kind of uh, functionality? Well, that's where the concept of uh, snippets uh, comes around the corner. And uh, snippets are really the, the core constructs uh, used in Lyft to enable uh, dynamic content and, and to handle uh, dynamic user input uh, from, uh, from, a, uh, from a web page. Um, what is a snippet? Well, a snippet is actually just a Scala method, a Scala function. And the best way to view it is, is, uh, and is to view it as a uh, method that transforms uh, a node seek to a node seek. And you're probably wondering, okay, what, what is this node sequence? Well, you can uh, think of it just like uh, it's, it's part of your DOM. So actually what you're doing in a snippet is you're getting a part of your document object model, right? And you can tr transform it in Scala using any way you want. And then you give it back again to the framework and it will be uh, rendered into your uh, view. So this transformation is, is indeed pretty nice because you get a lot of guarantees by, uh, by doing it this way. Uh, because you're not just concatenating strings with HTML, etc. You're really working at the, 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 uh, the component level, at the DOM level. So you're guaranteed to have a well-formed DOM uh, when you begin, and guaranteed to have a well-formed uh, document of the model when you're uh, done with your transformation. And this also means that it's, it's trivial, trivial for Lyft to implement uh, uh, cross-site scripting and protection, right? So you can try to insert a stream with uh, script alerts, uh, etc., JavaScript uh, tags, but it will just treat it as a stream and it will never be turned into an actual DOM node. You have to do uh, a lot of work to, uh, to break that guarantee. And of course, in these, inside these snippets, you will use uh, database groups or you will use uh, other data sources uh, to uh, actually get the dynamic data and to put it into the DOM using this transformation. Um, so I guess this sounds pretty abstract, so let's get some uh, code uh, with it. Um, what we see here is uh, a, a view. Uh, in this case, uh, the view consists of a uh, lift tag which references an index snippet, and specifically the date uh, method on this index snippet. And inside this is the part of the DOM that we're going to uh, transform. Again, you're seeing here a specific Lyft uh, prefix. I will show you an alternative as well, which uh, does uh, use uh, such a tag. So in the same way as with the templating, you can really make this uh, designer friendly as well. Uh, but just uh, for stylists, uh, it's, it's nice to see this uh, approach. So in this case, uh, we have this uh, uh, part of the DOM with a specific uh, prefix uh, tag there, uh, in there as well, which contains a certain date. And we want to replace this with the actual uh, current date. So what happens is that when Lyft encounters this, it will uh, look for a class uh, in Scala uh, called index uh, snippet, and it will look for a method called uh, date on it. And as you can see, this date takes its parameter a uh, node sequence. And that node sequence will be this diff that will be presented to your method. And you will have to uh, return a, a sequence of nodes as well, because we're transforming from DOM to DOM, from node seek to node seek. And in this case, uh, Lyft uh, offers uh, several helper methods to implement this uh, implementation. In this case, you can use the bind uh, helper method and you say, okay, look in my input for a prefix, uh, a tag prefix with B, which is of course this B date, and with a tag name uh, date, and associate with uh, this tag a new date object. So, you're probably wondering where does this error come from, right? So uh, is this some kind of built-in operator or, or whatever? Uh, no, this is a Scala feature uh, which actually allows you to define methods uh, that consist of symbols. So an equivalent uh, notation for this would be uh, to call on the string the method uh, yeah, error with a, uh, a new data object. And this results in a, a tuple, which is just a combination of two fields in an uh, anonymous uh, data structure, uh, which contains this date and this date object. But then again, you're probably wondering where does this error method on the string come from, right? Because a string doesn't normally have this error method. 
uh, and, and how does it end up? Uh, that's oh, sorry. Let's go back. Uh, that's another feature of uh, of Scala, which means uh, which is called the implicit conversion, and this allows uh, you to define conversions from a, a certain type to another type, and this conversion is automatically inserted by the compiler. So at the moment, if it encounters an invocation of this error on a string and it says, okay, I don't know any uh, error method on a string, that will try to find this uh, uh, method by applying implicit conversions that are currently in scope. And this implicit conversion says, okay, if you have a string, I can convert it to a type of rich string, and this rich string extends uh, the, the number of methods uh, that are available on string by, for example, introducing this, uh, this error method. So, Anyway, all uh, that it is, this does is uh, replacing uh, the date uh, with uh, the current date calculated in the snippet. So, if we do this uh, in the way using uh, the, the class syntax, then uh, we have to use uh, a little bit of a different binding mechanism in the snippet as well. Uh, and uh, the different variable calls is uh, CSS binding. And I think you uh, all can see why this is, because it's largely inspired by the CSS status that you have uh, on your DOM. Uh, and what we can do then in the view is that we just have a, uh, a div with a class, which also invokes a, a snippet in the class CSS snippet with a method date. And this snippet will transform everything that's inside this div, right? And inside this div, there's a bit of text, and there's a span with a uh, ID date. And this date uh, contains uh, the, the, the placeholder value again that we had in the previous view as well. So actually, the signature of this, me this method is a bit different than the previous one as well, because in this case, we're not having a method that takes a node seek and returns a node seek. No, we have a method that doesn't take any parameters, but has to return a function type, a function, an actual function that can take a node, node sequence and transform it into another node sequence. And uh, this is done to make uh, things more composable, so you can compose multiple such functions, of course, in sort of a pipeline, uh, which makes it far easier to work with than the, the, the bind help method that we uh, saw earlier. So in this case, uh, again, uh, we're looking for uh, something with ID date, that will match this tag, of course, and we want to replace it with uh, the current date. In this case, uh, the current date is, of course, this, this new date uh, object. Again, what is happening here? Question? Yeah. Question. Uh, in your example, when you changed the way how you uh, how you written the view, and you changed uh, the snippet. Yeah. Are these it's just like uh, are these interchangeable? I mean, if, if you if you use the CSS binding. Is it mandatory to uh, use this alternative syntax for a snippet? Are these things related, or you, you can you can use you can write snippet and do in either of those styles, mm -hmm. and you can write view in either of those. Yeah. No, it's, it's it's not recommended. I'm not. I'm sure it's it will work in some sort of way, but it's not recommended to mix these approaches. So if you're going for this, this tag based approach, then you should really use the bind method. If you're going for the CSS selector and this is class based approach, then you should really use the CSS selectors to do tra transformation. So yeah. um, again, um, what we're doing here is constructing an actual function. So we're not really performing the transformation here. They will do it uh, based on whatever function that we return from this uh, method. So that's it's a bit different than in the previous approach where we really in the code already by invoking the bind uh, trigger the transformation. Um, and of course, again the CSS selector is a string, so it has to be implicitly converted to something much much rich, richer than a string uh, that contains this uh, nice uh, replace uh, symbol. And uh, that's uh, implemented by uh, Lyft by uh, giving you a implicit conversion from string to uh, the type to CSS by the part of a bit of implementation detail, but I guess you're wondering uh, what's, what's actually going on here. So, question? No, sorry, current date in this case is a, should be a, a, a parameter uh, that's, this, for example, defined as a field or a uh, Yeah, but I left it out here. But it just as easily have been the, the new date constructor that I called in the previous uh, slide. So, 
if you're using HTML5, then you have this nice mechanism uh, called data, and then you don't have to pollute your class anymore with these uh, lift notifications, but instead you can use the data uh, hyphen uh, lift uh, uh, approach, and then uh, you're even more uh, uh, compatible with uh, actual HTML, uh, and even in the case that uh, your designer is uh, also changing classes, etc., etc., he doesn't have to uh, watch it more to, uh, to leave these uh, lift uh, invocations in there. Um, so, this is really not, not model view controller, right? We do not have a, a single controller for a single view, but instead we have these, these views that can reference snippets, and a single view can reference multiple snippets to, to do uh, different things, and uh, multiple sp and the snippets can be reused across multiple views. And it's really yeah, kind of a powerful uh, uh, situation. Uh, some, some, some criticism that I've heard on that is also that it's, you, you tend to get some sort of spaghetti integration between views and snippets, so it's certainly something you should be aware of and that you should be really uh, vigilant about, uh, not, not, not to, uh, to do it, uh, uh, you have to do it in a structured way, uh, so to say. But really, uh, if you think about it, there, there are many elements right on the page that, that can reuse on the other, uh, other pages, like a news, uh, news sticker or uh, a menu that's rendered uh, everywhere, or, uh, well, you can do this uh, using snippets and just easily re reuse it uh, across uh, several uh, views. So, let's get back to the application and look at some actual snippet code. In this case, let me again show this, uh, this home page. And here we see uh, this, this current both uh, example that we just had on the slides as well. Uh, if I reload, it should change. 1711 and 727. Okay, it works. Um, you're probably also wondering, okay, this is just replacing a single element. So what about like tables and lists of uh, values, etc.? How does that work? So here's also an example of a, uh, a table. And we'll have a look at how this table is uh, constructed by going to this index page. So, just quick, this, this date is just the same that, uh, that uh, we had in the slide, right? So, called index date, and it will replace this uh, span with the actual date. Then, uh, an example of how to create just a dynamic table. And in this case, we just write a regular HTML table, and in the class, we reference the snippet that should fill this table, index dot table contents in this case, and we define a single line uh, of, of the uh, table with a certain class and with uh, appropriate uh, columns which also have class so we can find them uh, during the transformation. And if we look at the associated code, then we can see that I create a, uh, a, a variable containing a list of two names. Uh, this in this case, Martin Wodersky, and I've separated the first and last name into uh, two elements of a tuple, and David Pollock, who is the uh, creator of the uh, Lift framework. And here's the actual uh, uh, snippet that uh, implements the, uh, the transformation. And uh, now the CSS selector goes on and tries to find an element with class nameline, and then it selects the child of this uh, element. So in this case, if we go back, we're interested in these two children, right? And what we're going to do is uh, take this list of persons. And of course, this can come from anywhere. This list currently is hard coded, but it could also be looked up in the database, right? And we map a function over this list. And this function takes this tuple and it constructs another transformation based on this, uh, this information that transforms a single line into uh, uh, these TD tags with the actual first name and last name between. So in this case, you can see that uh, we have the first name which is replaced with the first element of the tuple. Then we use this combinator, the AND function, to uh, combine two transformations into a single transformation. And we look there for the last name element and we re replace it with the second element of the tuple. And after we've done that, what ends up after this invocation, of this map invocation, is a list of transformations. And 
this, this, this replacement function is smart enough to know that on this side it has multiple items, and on this side it has these two items, and it will apply uh, this transformation as many times as there are elements in this list. So what we actually end up with is a, uh, a table with two lines, Martin Kondersky and David Paul. Okay, any questions uh, on that? Why else we continue? Because what we've seen so far is just uh, output, right? We're also concerned about the input in our web framework. And we can do this, fortunately, uh, with the same mechanism as we did uh, the dynamic output, and that's also using uh, snippets. And there's actually a kind of a nifty mechanism behind it, um, in that uh, you, in these snippets, you associate uh, anonymous functions, closures, uh, with form elements. And those get called at the time that the form uh, gets, is submitted by, uh, by, uh, by the user. So you you really have to think in, in sort of uh, anonymous functions, and I'll show an example of that later. Um, and uh, the nice thing is that this works in the same way for just plain request response as for uh, AJAX uh, requests. So there's no separate model for, for doing AJAX uh, uh, interaction. It's, it's also based on snippets and on uh, closures to uh, to handle this uh, this input. So an example uh, would be. Uh, this uh, form snippet, which is, uh, this defines uh, a method name form, and then we have a local variable inside this method, uh, which we initialize to uh, the end string, and we also have a nested method inside name. Uh, Scala allows you to nest almost everything, so a method inside a method is uh, perfectly uh, possible, and this method that can then, of course, refer to this local variable inside the other method. So. In this case, we want this method to be called when our form is submitted and we just bring it to the standard out. Now, of course, the snippet should return something, so we should return a transformation which transforms the actual view. In this case, the view consists of a standard uh, a form with a post method and, of course, information to link to this uh, snippet that we defined here and two input fields, just regular HTML input fields, uh, where you have ID, name fields, text fields and submit button and of course uh, we want to do something uh, once this submit button uh, is uh, actually uh, submitted. Uh, so what you can see here is that we combine two transformations into one with this and again um, and the interesting thing is here that you uh, actually replace, uh, replace this input element with an input element generated by, uh, by Lyft. And there's an SHML uh, uh, class there, which has many methods. In this case, we use text method for text input, but you also have Boolean, checkboxes, uh, select this, et cetera, et cetera. And they all follow the same pattern. They uh, take a parameter of the uh, uh, actual contents at, at this moment. There's a question, yeah? Uh, I'm sorry. What about refactoring? Uh, is it easy to refactor such uh such code, for example, I'd like to change uh, idea of first input name field. Should mm -hmm. I should I manually change uh, this ID in uh, Scala code? Yeah. So the question is, uh, how about uh, refactoring? Does it work across the view back into my uh, Scala code? And, and no, currently there's no IDE supports, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it could be done, of course, because it's also being done for JSF and expression language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, two different languages that are linked together, but currently it's just not uh, not implemented. Yeah. So what we actually see is that we associate a, an anonymous function with this uh, element as, uh, as well, and this function is being executed at the time that this uh, text box is uh, submitted again. In this case, we uh, just assign the value of this text to this local variable. And you might be wondering uh, uh, how this has happened, but this is a shorthand form just to take uh, an input in the closure and to assign it to, uh, to a variable. And the submit button here, uh, also has a behavior uh, associated with, in this case, we give the title click and we wanted to call the process form method uh, at the moment that this uh, button is clicked. Um, and in this case, what will happen when the form is submitted is that this will see that this text box has been submitted. It will see, oh, it has this function associated with it, so I will run it. 
it has closed over this local state, so there's nothing you have to do. That's all uh, part of uh, Scala closures. And we'll uh, update this to the uh, current value of the text box. And then we'll see, oh, uh, the submit button uh, has been clicked. And it will invoke this process form method, uh, which we give here a sort of function pointer. Yeah. To, to prefill it, yeah. Yeah, but after we change it, it, it sh looking from this code, it should, it should be empty, still empty. Like, like after we submit the form, mm -hmm. it will render the page with still empty content. That's right. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. So if you submit this form, it will not uh, retain this because uh, uh, that's something I haven't told yet, but uh, Lyft will instantiate a new uh, instance of the snippet for every uh, request. So. But the name is just local variable. I mean, you right. Right. So uh, the first parameter actually, no, the first parameter actually refers to the value of this. Uh, this uh, yeah. Okay. But I'd like to continue. Uh, see that we're running out of time. Um, so you might think to yourself, okay, this is very nice, but it's all a bit low level, right? You're working with these single elements in the form, and you're working with associated these functions, and. As you said, it will be empty, so what if there's a validation error and you want to preserve it? So there's all kinds of things that you have to think about. Uh, luckily, there are several abstractions built on top of these foundations uh, within Lyft to uh, make it easier to, uh, to declare and uh, specify such forms, which, uh, one of which is uh, Lyft Screen, which is de uh, a de uh, declarative way of creating a form and associated validation, and also giving you conversion to the expected types uh, for free. Uh, and an action method on actual uh, successful uh, uh, submit of a screen, which means that all fields are validated. And to expand on that, there's also a, a widget which just composes multiple screens and uh, allows you to implement the uh, logic to transition between screens uh, declaratively. And the nice thing is you can easily switch uh, the functionality of these screens and these uh, widgets between just regular uh, request and uh, response and uh, Ajax uh, request and response. So, just to get back to the code, I'll show you uh, what such a screen looks like. First, I'll show it in action. In this case, I'll click a screen here. It just has uh, several fields which ask me about a favorite color, uh, for example, red, and I'd like to like you. And no, not really. And it will uh, redirect me to the homepage again with a, uh, a message which is rendered here. Okay, please tell the truth next time. You said. Uh, didn't uh, do really. Uh, do a really long call to trigger a validation error. You'll see that uh, it does some uh, validation here and it will get back to you. And in this case, we can fix it. My input was preserved, so I'll just chop it down to a bit shorter. And we'll see. Oh, okay, I like the light half of uh, two. Whatever that may be. So, how is this implemented in, uh, in code? We'll go to the same simple directory and we'll look at the favorite color screen. Uh, you can see it extends the uh, live screen, which is a built-in class to support this uh, screen functionality. And what we simply have to do is we uh, define three values, which of course correspond to the three uh, fields that we have. And we can say, okay, this uh, should be a field with this uh, caption and these validations on it. There are others, uh, of course, as well uh, with a message. Uh, by the way, everything can be internationalized as well in uh, uh, this. I didn't do it here, but it's possible. Um, and a radio button with a list of options and a uh, Boolean uh, field, really, with a default value of uh, false. And we have this uh, finish method, which is only called when all the fields of the screen are uh, valid. Question? Uh, previous snippet was a class, but, uh, but now it's an object. What is the reason? Could you please explain it about it? Okay. Um, the question is, it's a class. Uh, the snippets were a class, but now it's an object. As long as you don't use uh, mutable state inside your snippet, it can be either an object or a class. It's, it's your decision. Um, when you start using mutable state inside a snippet, you need to make it a class because uh, you will want a new instance every time the snippet is evaluated. In this case, we have an object and we have some fields, but you can see those are mutable fields. 
and the screen itself is uh, smart enough to associate different uh, inputs with different users, so you don't have to take care of it. So that's why I went, in this case, I made an object. Um, okay, but in this is finished function, you can see that we can just read out the value of this field by uh, uh, calling the is method. And uh, we use the state mechanism of lift, which is the s object, s dot notice, I like, or read them out with the actual values. And this notice then will be uh, printed on the next page that is rendered. It's a bit like the face inspection just of uh, JSF, right? And if we didn't uh, do, uh, if, it, if it was uh, a false, then uh, we do a warning with a piece of truth next time. And we can do a redirect uh, after uh, the finish method uh, has been called. Okay. Let's see. Finish up a bit more because I believe we're almost out of time. That means just this thing I'd like to show you because it, uh, it's all about this interactivity uh, that I uh, talked about. Um, it's a demo that you can also look up uh, online, but uh, it's, it's really nice. It's based uh, on actors. Um, actors in Scala uh, are really nice for uh, modeling concurrent uh, interactions with your users. In this case, we have a single chat server actor, and we can have so-called comment actors. Uh, comment is used for server push from server to uh, to the users directly. Um, each one, uh, each browser is represented by a, a comment actor, and in this case, uh, I'll do a small demonstration of this chat which updates in real time if everything goes okay. So on this screen I'll say, hi, bam, it's there as well. Hello, two, and it's here as well. So um, just to finish how that's implemented in code, as you can see we have a chat client, which is this, uh, this uh, comment actor, actor that's instantiated for each user. And we have this uh, chat server, which is the central uh, actor. There's only one of it, so it's an object as well. It extends lift actor. And the most important thing is that you can have a, uh, a variable in here which contains all the chat messages. So this is sort of our ma master actor. Um, it knows how to create updates. We just create a case class containing uh, the messages. And uh, every time this uh, uh, master actor uh, uh, receives a new string from a user, it will uh, append the string to the list and it will uh, send uh, an update to all listening common actors. So all users will get this complete list again. Um, there's also a case object uh, clear. If we uh, get a clear message, then we uh, just uh, zero out this list and we update the list. So, uh, of course, you're wondering what does this client look like? Well, in this case, the client is a class because there will be a single instance for every user. Uh, it extends the uh, comment actor. It also uh, uh, holds on to these uh, messages in order to render them. It renders it itself with the uh, chat server so it can uh, receive these updates. And this is actually where we are doing our uh, message handling uh, code in this uh, actor. So we receive this update from our central chat server with, which contains the, the chat messages. Uh, we send it to our own local variable and we call the re-render method of this comment actor. And actually what will happen is that uh, uh, Lyft will call this uh, method and it will re-render the view uh, on just, just part of the view using the transformation defined here. I won't go into detail about the uh, transformation, but you can see that I use some AJAX, AJAX primitives here. And, uh, um, when uh, a message is submitted, I'm actually sending this message to the chat server using this uh, uh, bank operator. So that's how you message pass in, in, uh, in, uh, in Scala. Um, and of course, we uh, we bind these messages to the uh, to this items to get them past the. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, if uh, these are, are, are they, uh, if these are like uh, regular actors in Scala, mm -hmm. does that no. quite well with to? Okay, so the question is, uh, uh, these are regular actors in Scala? Well, not really. These are a specific actor implementation. Uh, by this, so there are actually three implementations of actors currently: the Aka actors, the Scala actors, and the Lyft actors. Um, uh, Scala and Aka actors are uh, merging in version 2.10, so those will be uh, converted to a single implementation. 
Um, and these actors in Lyft are a complete uh, separate library, which really looks a lot like the uh, standard Scala uh, actors, but they're, they're different, and they can send, uh, send messages to each other. No, no that, it's not really difficult to use ACA. Uh, you uh, just have to do a bit of work to wire it up uh, with the command mechanism of, uh, of Lyft, because that's the hook you want, of course, the whole uh, data memory. So just to show, uh, as a last thing, uh, the view of this chat example is nothing more than just a div uh, which calls uh, uh, a div comment, which is a built-in snippet. And we say, well, we want a comment of the type chat client here. And we have this, this template for these messages, which we bind to in each update. And we have this form in which you can input a message and, and uh, uh, input, uh, submit input the type which you can click, and then you actually send a message to the chat server, and it's a clear button, which uh, should actually uh, 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 send a clear message to the chat server. And by using uh, on the form uh, tag, this, uh, this snippet application, also built-in snippet uh, from this form of Ajax, this form is automatically turned into an Ajax form. You don't have to do anything more. Um, and I see that I have five minutes left, so I'd like to give room for some questions. Which means that I'll switch to one of my last slides. Who uses it? Well, I guess there's some familiar names uh, in here uh, using Lyft. Uh, Foursquare, really big site, uh, millions of users, uh, The Guardian, well known uh, newspaper, and also some startups like uh, Stackmob, and also some very conservative uh, companies like uh, SAP. Uh, surprisingly, uh, use uh, Lyft. And uh, I'll leave this up here uh, just for you to, uh, to assess for yourself if you like what you saw or not. Uh, uh, are there any questions about uh, Lyft or its users? Thank you for the speech. Uh, I've got a question about uh, what depends on the real uh, interactivity. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so you're thinking of this, this single single page web application uh, kind of model, right? No, not, not really. Uh, the question about uh, could, could I uh, create a web page and put it on the interface? Okay, so the question is uh, can you dynamically rebuild parts of the user interface? Yeah. So what I did was transformations using existing DOM to a slightly modified other DOM. What you can also do is, with snippets is just ignore your input DOM and read in another template from Lyft and just push that to your client. So you can actually really implement uh, very dynamic things. Um, I didn't do this here because I think this is confusing enough already. And uh, that's one of the things that I don't like about Lyft. It has a very steep learning curve. But once you get to know it, it's, it's really, really powerful, and, and things like that are possible as well. Okay. Question. Um, there are like, you have objects there, and you have this class that have been instantiated. Is there any way to use some, some way of uh, inversion of control here, or like a pattern, or maybe other other uh, inversion? Okay, so the question is, do you have any uh, dependency injection inversion of control yeah. methods? Um, there is. Uh, uh, a sort of uh, dependency injection mechanism built into Lyft, but it's not really widely used. Um, and, and you talk about the cake pattern, which is a specific uh, Scala pattern to do uh, uh, dependency injection using uh, language features only. And, and you could do that, but only to a certain extent, because indeed uh, uh, Lyft instantiates these snippets for you, and it's, it's kind of hard to have a hook in there. Um, I must say that the whole sitemap mechanism that I didn't really get too deep into, but that also allows you to associate uh, uh, certain services and functions with certain locations of the page. Those are automatically available to your students then. So that's a, a form of, of dependency injection uh, that you can use. One question? In your experience, you said that uh, you're working also on Scala and Java projects. So uh, in Netherlands, uh, who is ready to use, or in other words, who is ready to pay? Mm -hmm. for it for development uh, at least. Uh, is it government or is it some, uh, I don't know, e-commerce companies? Who exactly, from your experience? Yeah, so the good question is uh, who's, who's willing to pay for, uh, for Scala development in general and maybe this uh, in particular. Um, 
it's, it's typically the really engineering driven uh, uh, organizations, right? So, so you're quickly thinking about uh, startups with this time to market uh, issue, right? And, uh, and, and things like Foursquare, uh, that's of course in the States. Um, in the Netherlands, I, I see it uh, mainly in, uh, in, uh, in web companies like uh, auction uh, companies who really like this interactivity uh, features uh, of, uh, of Scala and Lyft. Um, and also, uh, uh, there, there is a currently a bank that I'm consulting with, which is also uh, contemplating the use of uh, Scala and even maybe Git. So that's, that's quite a conservative institution, and, and they really see some, some benefits in terms of power and expressiveness uh, there. Um, but yeah, just to say that there's a certain market that's, that's really uh, using this, uh, I wouldn't really say that. It's, yeah, it depends on a client to client basis. But mostly uh, really engineering different uh, companies which can see the beauty and the, and the power of this approach. Okay, it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you all for listening. Hope you uh, enjoyed. <laughs>